All right, we're joined by Ralph Gio. Uh, he needs no introduction. You guys will get all that in the beginning of this podcast anyway. But thank you so much for joining Hard Parking. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. So I know we, uh, we met out in the wild, and it was uh, it's amazing how uh, our people tend to, to, to congregate like that. So it's a pleasure to, to kind of re-meet you again digitally here. You know what's funny is I th- the icebreaker, well, I don't like using that term, but I saw you and I go, hey, that's the guy that some of my friends from Michigan have tagged me in the photos and we don't look really anything alike. You know, we <laughs> share some pigment maybe and maybe some hairstyles. Part of the uh, coconut. But, you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, uh, <laughs> what size, right? So when, you're, when you wear a hat, where are you? Because I, I am one one latch away from being too big. No, I'm. Uh, my head's kind of an average head. My helmet's uh, usually a, a large, let's put it that way. So. Okay. Yeah. yeah. We'll talk about some of the racing and stuff. You know, one of the things I want to ask you is, because I've gone through a lot of your, your things online, and not in a, in a creeping fashion, but, you know, I want to be, you know, honor your time. And I don't like asking things that people could find in literally two seconds if they just open up, you know, Google and looked. Uh, but one of the things is, you know, what's something, what's a design you've been associated with that or you had a major role in that seems to continuously surprise people that maybe don't necessarily <laughs> look into your background as much ah things like the the pacifica the grand cherokee and the ram i mean people uh, think of me for the viper and 300 um typically uh but yeah i actually love these kind of mainstream cars that that are uh, that really are supporting the company i mean they're the the bread and butter of of how we make money um and i learned because those customers are not myself right so i'm designing i'm a car guy so to speak designing cars for moms and and truck lovers and all that so i I really love the idea of jumping into those people's minds and heads and doing the research and then trying to crack the code on relevant product that's going to be hopefully segment leading stuff so that's that's really what i love to do as a as a problem solving you know uh, mentally oriented designers so you strike me as someone who's very personable, not only for the fact that I, you know, personally got to meet you, but just in kind of watching you interact with other people, you know, what, where does that come from? Wow. Uh, I think part of it's two parts. One is, is growing up uh, as a minority. I grew up um, uh, in, in a relatively, not such a diverse part of Montreal, Canada. So I had to kind of assimilate. I had to understand how to work with a lot of different cultures. Now we had Greeks, we had Italians, we had Armenians, we had the Lebanese, we had white, we had all kinds of stuff, but the black community was quite small. So I, I kind of was forced to integrate with a lot of different types of people. Um, but in my modern day life, that's long gone. I'm, I'm kind of used to it now. That's not an issue now. More, it's for me, every single person I meet is an opportunity to do market research. You know, <laughs> I'm really um, taking an opportunity to, to kind of deconstruct uh, needs and wants, try to fight what we call them design latent needs. What are people missing or what are they hankering for so that's just in a conversation people will describe something that they they wish existed uh, especially when they know you're a designer that's, that's the first thing they start downloading i wish you did that or that so uh, i love meeting strangers i love going to new cities and, and kind of even just walking through a new city is a anthropology project for me you know and just looking at how things work what people choose to drive every time i see a car go by i look who's driving it how old they might be you know what <laughs> what's their mm. story uh, so i'm just a curious george kind of person to be honest you know, that's, that's, um, I, I was listening to that when you go to, you know, cars and coffees and things, you know, yeah. how often can you go to those things outside of, let's say Monterey car week and just kind of blend into the crowd? Depends. I mean, I, I jump into, I've been to Porsche ones. I've been to, uh, Radwood. I love, I really like Radwood. Those I can kind of go a little bit longer and blend in and, and dip, depending on what I try not to wear stuff that says Mopar Dodge on it, but, um, right. I go to Carlisle, forget it. I, I can't go more than. 10 feet <laughs> but that's fun in its own way obviously uh, some of these people i've been to the shows over the years and i know them. people actually i see them grow up i see them bring their kids uh there's one little girl that i met when she was 12 years old and i saw her now she's 20 and it's amazing that i have a picture same picture with mm. her 10 years later and it's kind of cool that she's still into the hobby uh so there's a sense of community that i really don't mind being part of I actually enjoy it but i go to a lot of stuff like pebble beach but that's a design community that we know each other and then you got the i would right. say the enthusiast community What's amazed me in the last few years is now any kind of cars and coffee, there seems to be somebody who's, who's, um, who I have something in common with or has seen something of, that I've done on, on one of the shows. So that's kind of cool. I think that's, I, I don't, I love that because it's, it's an opportunity to again get to meet that person. What happens, I turn the conversation around and they want to know all about my life. And within probably about a minute, I'm interviewing them, you know, so it's a lot more fun that way. Yeah. Cause you're more of a, 
I mean, I think the key communication is being an active listener. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't really understand that, right? Because that, that way you get to learn about people, um, their likes or dislikes. And for your case, you know, you can turn around and apply that personally, but also apply that to what you do every day. It's food Speaking of which, right, 30 years, I think five companies within that 30 years-ish. No, 32 years, uh, one company. Uh, but uh, the joke I like With to name, say is- The mergers 11, and stuff. Yeah, 11 different CEOs right. um, in my time and about, yeah, five, you know, the company's changed names five times. My business cards are five right. different- uh, with that comes completely different cultures, different missions. Sometimes um, fascinating, actually. Every one of the, every one of those chapters has been enlightening for me. Um, brought travel. I mean, I spent time in Germany when we were at Mercedes, so I spent a lot of time with the Germans and got to see the inner workings of Mercedes Benz. And then um, Alfa Romeo, one of the brands I've loved since I was a kid. Can't believe I was able to work on some Alfa Romeos. And actually, I still to this day go to Italy all the time in Turin and visit our studios there. Work with Maserati actively now with uh, Klaus Busa in uh, Italy, and now the French. I've always been a French a fan of uh, the 205 GTI. One of the cars I wanted to get one one day, and I finally did get one right before the merger. I just happened to buy it, and I didn't even know we were going to merge with Peugeot and, and uh, Citroen. And here we are now, all one big happy family. Uh, so it's been an amazing journey. Um, so I am an anomaly, I think, in this world. Typically, in, in my t- line of work, people don't stay more than ten years; they kind of move on. It's, it's normal. For designers to bop around but i've kind of I've, it's changed around me i haven't, haven't had to because it's kind of my assignments keep changing uh when i'm in place here what was there besides cars was there anything in high school <laughs> like an example <laughs> you know i thought i was going to design jordans and uh, jumpsuits uh, when i was in high school I, and cars i was a nerd i loved calculus i loved physics uh still do um i was really good at math uh wasn't so good at trigonometry that's when it kind of went sideways uh, I liked art history, stuff like that. So I thought I was going to be an engineer. I really, I like the mm-hmm. mechanical side of a car as much as I like the design. I, I spent a lot of time wrenching. I've built many, many engines. I've put in lowering kits on, I can't tell you how many cars. Um, done a lot of harnesses. I love building wiring harnesses. I've done um, emission, uh, injection modifications on carb cars. I've tr- converted them to injection, did all the programming myself. So really, that's how I flesh out my engineering needs. So I went down that path, but the uh, art side of me kept tugging at my heart, you know, the industrial, um, the sketching side. So when I was a kid, I would sketch all the time, but then build model cars, take them back apart, build them again. You know, so I kind of had this vibration between mechanical and art. And I finally chose the art path as, as probably to go against my parents' wishes. <laughs> so it was one of those things. Where what what were my, your parents' wishes? Well, I wanted me to be a doctor. My brother, my older brother is your brother. Yep. the classic, uh, you know, I joke, but from the Haitian community, a lot of Haitian uh, immigrants, uh, which is my, my family's from, uh, a lot of them are doctors because it's a surefire. You go to school, become a doctor, make some money. That tends to be the the, the flow. And, and I think a lot of immigrants or minorities can relate to that. Parents push them in those, in those ways. Um, and I just didn't want to do that. I, I can't stand the sight of blood. So being a doctor wasn't going to work for me. <laughs> You mentioned your love for alphas. Uh, yeah. Can we talk about your, at some point before the end of this call, your your S2000 alpha? Oh, yeah. I mean, I have a few alphas. I've, I've been very lucky. And, and they weren't expensive years ago. So I bought a few of those the juniors. I've right. um, been you know, tinkering with alphas for a long, long time. Um, now they're so suddenly they're very valuable. Um, but my, my latest project, if you want to go there, I bought a GTV6, a, a mid-80s GTV6, um, and I ended up putting an S2000 engine swap in it. Uh, only literally my friend just said, hey, why don't you do it? And I said, uh, okay. It was during COVID, so I had a, a bit more downtime than normal. So just started getting my sawzall out. I bought a whole, uh, on a skid, I bought the entire, literally the entire S2000 engine, transmission, uh, rear cradle, everything, and then started. And it fit. I mean, a lot of metal work, a lot of fabrication, but right. I've got this bizarre... Um, First time I've done anything like that is kind of out. And the funniest part, I shared it with my alpha buddies all over the world. And I, I thought they were going to put a hit on me or something. <laughs> they loved it that much. No, I love the GTV6. So we had that conversation. And I think there's one. So this is July 10th. I think there's one, a project car on Bring a Trailer right now. And so now every time I see that, I think about, wow, what can I do with that based on what Ralph's? I'll send you a, a picture of it. Maybe you can flash it up when you post produce it. Oh, absolutely, man. What's um what's one of the biggest misses? Are you allowed to talk about those? What's something uh, that, that Ralph was like, oh, this is gonna be this is gonna be killer, and then it wasn't. 
I think, um, to be honest, the Viper. So I'll tell you why. Uh, and actually, which in gen? It, the Gen Five. I think. Uh, oh, I know. I know. Hold on. But it <laughs> launched. It had a rough launch because when it launched, I remember yeah. being there and people are like, "Where's the paddle ship? Where's the automatic?" Or it didn't have all of those accoutrements that people, everybody else was doing. Right. So that you know, I thought we missed something and. And probably we should have made the car maybe a couple inches longer, just a little bit for taller people. That was still a sticking point. Just little things like that. But the biggest thing was transmission, right? Should we have done mm -hmm. a pedal? Now you see what happened to Porsche. They've done PDK, the back to manual, the back, you know what I mean? There's always this age old would people want what they don't have <laughs> in a way. But now in retrospect, right. the cars are, are understood now. They're beloved and the values are going up. So I wouldn't say it was a miss, but it's like I always wonder had we launched it with with the, the two options with a paddle. We couldn't afford it at the time. We did the car in the middle of um, exiting bankruptcy, so it was not the easiest thing to to imagine. But I'm very happy overall. I mean, uh, to see people you know doing am amazing things on the track with the ACR, and it's uh, it's really cool that that car even happened at all. People don't realize that's the other thing. People don't realize these cars just mm. don't happen. I mean, it takes a lot uh, to conjure these things up. So instead of complaining, what you don't have, just worship the fact that the car even exists. You know, I'm talking about all supercars, all any of those low volume, uh, they're, they're miracle babies. When you look at what corporations really have to focus on. You know, I saw that car cause I remember cause I had just moved here to Arizona. This was 2014. So I saw a couple of them out there and that's the first, you know, I, I like all Vipers pretty much, but that one was the first one I fell in love with since the GTS I think it was at 97, 98. And I go, oh, that's yeah. a cool Viper. And it was actually on my short list of cars that I was looking at before I bought my Type S that I have now. But the prices started going up. I'm like, do I really <laughs> want to do that now? And now they're just continually gone up. So, I mean, maybe it's been a, somewhat of a miss, but not really. But that's a that's a beautiful car, man. Thank you. And it's taught me how to drive. I mean, I when I first got, I had a 96 I got uh, in late to the middle of the 2000s. And it's a, it was a handful. So I took it to the track. I, I got driving lessons and, and I finally mastered how to drive that car. And the Gen 5 is a lot easier to, to drive. Um, but once you master a Viper, everything else is easy to drive. So it really has helped me develop my reflexes, my skills, and, and really understand what, what cars can do. Yeah. You know, you talked a little about all the travel you do earlier. Yeah. And so I have a question for you. You know, Ralph today in 2024 versus Ralph in 2004, how different is the complexity of your life? Wow. Um, well, it's almost, you got to throw COVID in there. So before COVID, I was flying to Italy uh, probably 11 times a year, 10 to 11 times a year, going to uh, board meetings in Amsterdam or Lond London, actually, sorry, four times a year, uh, going to South America twice a year, China twice a year. And then got, that's not even mentioning all the stuff within the U.S. Um, you know the you know the concourse shows I go to, the auto show the re reveals, the media launches. I was always at an airport, um, so that and that's been my life as long as I can remember. The last few years has changed. We've learned to go digital, which has really cut back my travel by two thirds at least. Um, and my roles are a little different now. We you know when we merge, we kind of split the baby. So my my counterpart that came from the the Peugeot side has taken over Alpha and, and some of the brands over there. I still have Maserati, but I have a really good team there that can handle it. And I've got some studios in South America that are run again. by I've got some really good people in place. I've learned how to delegate a little bit. So I got some of my life back. Let's put it that way. I can balance. But there was a time in my life for from about 2006 till till 2019, I, I, I woke up in hotel rooms not knowing where I was sometimes. <laughs> Let's go back a little bit further then. Yeah. You get your job. At what point? Did you realize, like, what was your this is real moment? You know, was it when you were meeting somebody that you maybe in a million years never thought you would meet? <laughs> your first paycheck? You know, that letter, uh, the original letter? I, yeah, all of that. I mean, I think, um, I mean, this is my dream job. You know, so I'm, I'm one of those kids that, yep. that wanted to do this. Uh, didn't know what exactly what it was, but I wanted to be in the industry designing cars. And it's far exceeded all of that. I mean, yeah, I designed cars with a team. I mean, started off. You know, most artists think of themselves as single contributors, but you quickly learn that designing cars takes a village, literally a village of people, engineers, designers. So yeah. that being part of that has been awesome. You know, being part of this family, growing up and watching these things be born, literally. But for me, the, the turning point, there's been a few um, in terms of the biggest promotion I got was being a director in 2001. I was head of the made very young, 31 years old. Uh, very unusual as one of the youngest directors in the company. And I didn't want the job. I was like, what are you doing? You guys are nuts. I'm still a, you know, a manager. I just want to enjoy what I'm doing. 
but they saw something in me. I don't know what it is. They, they kind of threw me at the deep end of the pool. So I had to learn quickly how to interface with execs at much older than myself, much more experience. So that was a kind of a uh, feet to the fire moment. Um, uh, really changed my life. I had to really change my priorities. I just had kids too. Like I had one kid born, my wife was pregnant. So I was right in the thick of it. I was going to grad school at the time that I got the promotion. So I was still in, in uh, business school. So everything was happening at the same time. Like, oh my God, <laughs> I was like, what have I done? Uh, but I loved it at the same time. I kind of got off on that, on that challenge, let's say. Um, so yeah, that moment was like, wow, this is real. You know, this career is no joke. Uh, so I went from being a designer now to almost a businessman and also a team leader and learning how to, to speak. And I got asked to speak at a lot of things. So it was really you know, converging of all these things. It was really pretty exciting at the same time. Scary. You know? uh, speaking of speaking, when's the last time you got nervous or do you still get nervous before a speech? Or an Not anymore. Uh, I just did my first commencement speech and I was nervous before that because it hit me as I was going up there that there's, you know, 300 or 400 young people that are kind of looking at me as, am I still relevant? I thought to myself at 54 years old, am I relevant talking to a bunch of 22 year olds or 23 year olds? Uh, so yeah, it made me nervous because I'm in the automotive, I'm kind of used to speaking to the automotive world, but this was a diff because not everybody in the audience, most of them were not auto, only 20 of them were just car designers, the rest are graphic artists, fine artists. So re, how do you, are, it, I felt like I was talking to my teenage da- or my daughters you know? <laughs> and I can only be so relevant to, to a 22 year old um, child, a woman. Um, so that was something that, uh, probably rocked me. And then I had another, uh, commencement speech a month later and I, I got that one down. So let's say, uh, doing it for the first time is always a bit nerve wracking. Do you think kind of a psychological thing, do you think that stems from a lot of times when you're doing things with people in the automotive world, you're talking and you have peers that you're very familiar with around, even if they're not directly in front of you versus just this yeah. entire room full of complete strangers? That's it. Yeah. Plus they can relate. You know, you get the laughs when you kind of talk about things that they can relate to uh, very easily. So talking to, to a generation, you know, four, just three, four generations younger than yourself, you have to leap into their minds. And that's something about public speaking that I've learned um, is don't ever speak to yourself. Right? You kind of have to really understand what your audience is looking to get out of the moment. Be quick, be, be you know, efficient with what you're saying, but be present. And that's something I use in, in my whole life, you know, being present, not just kind of going into a bit of a daze and just going on send. You really have to be in the moment, understand what the person on the other side of, of yourself is, is, is excited to hear or wants to get out of it. So that's, that's, that's not easy. Has imposter syndrome ever set in? Of course. The feeling that, yeah. Yeah. Does, does it happen? Does it still happen now? Or it was a lot early on? All the time. I mean, I get, um, I think personally, I, I think I've gotten way too much credit for a lot of the great stuff this company's put out um because it's convenient i mean for most journalists that's on the name they might know so it's you know ralph did this or he penned that or he you know was part of this so i, I really i despise that because i know it's not the case mm-hmm. you know it takes a you know i'm a at this point i'm a coach i'm like a football coach i don't run the ball i don't i'm not the quarterback i'm literally the coach on the sidelines now making sure my team uh can win the game and that's what i do right so i can't get i can't get to the accolades for running this touchdown when I'm the coach, right? So there's a lot of people behind the scenes that don't get enough credit. Now, imposter syndrome is probably going a little too far, but um, right. there's definitely times that that kind of invades my mind, and I, I try my best to reflect, you know, and really celebrate my team every chance I get. Yeah, I've noticed you're a you're a big we guy, not a me guy or an I guy. You know, and there's a lot of people I think in the industry, any industry who's had any you know levels of success that kind of forget about the we when they're talking you know is that something you have to consciously think about or is that just it's second nature now and i and i i definitely had a uh, a run-in with the boss many many years ago when i presented and i said i you know a lot and i, I actually speak about this to, I, I mentor a lot of young people and speak at schools and i talk about that a lot you know the uh, you have to be careful because it's easy to say i it's some mm-hmm. t- tempting sometimes to to want to be the star in that moment and learning to to say we just that detail that the using we versus i uh, can go a long way to endearing yourself with your mates and also showing, um, and that actually gets you more respect from your bosses. Cause I notice it now right. when I'm, you know, listening to my people. So yeah, very, very powerful to we. <laughs> Let's get into some Detroit stuff. You know, I had this thought cause I, we lived in Grand Rapids 15, 17 years. And, you know, when we wanted to go out and party, I think we went to Windsor once, which is yeah. you know, just past when we first bought my NSX. 
every other time we went to Chicago, you know, what's it been like to kind of see Detroit seemingly um, hit kind of the proverbial rock bottom and kind of work its way back up? And you're still I'm there so like in the thick. I'm so glad you asked that question because, um, and Detroit's finally getting, you know, first population mm-hmm. growth, I think, in the, this last year, it finally is is growing in, in population. And I, I've exa- I, I came to the city, I remember, I thought something happened because <laughs> We got lost and drove right down Woodward on the way to, to get dropped off at school. And my, my parents and I were looking out of the car. What happened? There was not a soul on the sidewalks. There was nothing going on on Saturday afternoon. And we couldn't believe it. And we come from Montreal, which is a city, you know, at the time was a metropolitan city. People are bustling and everything. So we just, first of all, that was a shock to us. Then we learned, you know, over the years that that was pretty normal in Detroit. Today, Detroit looks like Chicago. Detroit looks like not right. as new york city or anything like that but it's it's incredible the riverfront's developed uh uh the eat scene is incredible a lot of these uh, and i give a lot of credit to uh the gentleman from rocket mortgage who's invested in in a lot of detroit's uh, infrastructure the older buildings are being repurposed reconverted into beautiful uh shops uh living uh, a lot of people are turning those into homes so now you have uh, the book tower is half residential a little bit of business beautiful restaurants at the bottom and there's a rooftop I mean, these beautiful buildings that were literally empty for 30 years are are being redone. And finally, the, the train station, I give Ford a lot of credit. They invested heavily, the Ford family, the Ford Foundation, into uh, rehabilitating the old train station. And that was an eyesore for as long as I can remember. You would drive, you probably remember on freeway and seeing that thing sitting there with the windows out, you know, dark, ominous, you know, <laughs> dystopian thing. And now it's just gorgeous uh, icon that people are going to travel from all over the world to see you know so it's beautiful to watch it, it warms my heart to see that and it makes it easier to hire people so now i, I can right. hire people from california from all over the u.s even the world that want to live in detroit they want to literally live in the city commute if they have to or you know work from from their apartments but it's it's completely turned around and the city's safer the city's beautiful and people live in it the key to a city is for people to live in the city limits and that's slowly happening where you're actually getting residents now back in the city. So there's a part of freeway from, I think, just past Ann Arbor over mm-hmm. to Detroit Metro, the airport. Is that, yep. does that still look like it's been a bomb zone or they've- Oh, you know, no, it's cleaned up. Yeah, yeah, you, <laughs> you need to make a trip up here. So when the Super Bowl came years ago, uh, I think about 10 years ago, the Super Bowl visited and that's when that got cleaned up. The freeway got redone. Um, the nice. tire got redone, the famous tire. Uh, got redone and modernized the bridge over telegraph got redone and that just keeps happening so there's all these road projects the roads are pretty much beautiful now a lot of roads have been completely uh like ground up redone so the city has really gotten a fresh coat of paint and a lot of investment a lot of uh, influx of tech in in the area around detroit a lot of tech companies setting up here so it's 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 a it's a great story cleveland is, is going through the same thing toledo cincinnati a lot of these Midwestern cities are getting a second life and it's great. And what we're finding is people that had left the cities to go find work elsewhere are coming back in their forties and putting roots down here. So it's, it's just amazing. It's hard to find a home now because (laughs) you can't find houses anymore because everybody's bidding uh, to get in. Yeah. Yeah, That hasn't always been a problem there. If you you could buy an entire (laughs) block for like 30 grand 12 years ago, just outside Detroit. I know we're off topic here, but uh, there are people that have literally bought for a dollar entire sections of, of the city and right. converted them into housing. Beautiful brownstones or, you know, these beautiful, uh, they're track houses, but they're gorgeous. They're very, very nice, you know, $150,000 homes for people. They're fantastic. Sounds like a tremendous ROI. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So as, as I was getting ready for this, you know, I had to make sure I was shaven and clean. And I started thinking, I was like, Ralph's always like clean shaven, you know, so 30 <laughs> X years, I mean, you're 54, multiple decades full of fashion trends and things like that. You know, have you ever tried to experiment growing the goatee or a mustache or the beard? Uh, so Doris, like, fact, cut it out or what? Sometimes uh, I, I can grow a beard like yourself. Uh, if I stop shaving on a Wednesday by Monday, I look like you. So I grow a beard very quickly. And sometimes I do that. If I have a long weekend, I don't. I kind of don't shave on the weekends and I grow a little rough. Uh, and I, That's when I realize how old I am. I get the little salt and pepper. Uh, but my, I've been sh- clean shaven on my melon since I was 27 years old. And it was, it started off as an economical decision. I got tired of going to the barber every two, two weeks and spending 20 bucks or 30 bucks, whatever it was. So I decided to learn how to shave my own head. <laughs> so I've been doing it ever since I spend that money on tires and other things Yeah, for my race car. Did you ever, did you ever experiment with like the ball head shavers and things like that? Foil shavers and 
I so tried it all down to a razor. None of it, yep, none of it works. I use a Fusion Mach 5 and a little gel, and that's all. It's faster. Keep it simple. Yep. <laughs> yeah, as long as you stay on it, it's it's definitely faster. You know, one of the things I talk about a lot is perception versus reality. And, mm-hmm. you know, my perception is probably a lot of people's perceptions. We see Ralph out there, and I see you on interviews you know, uh, magazines, racing cars, having a lot of success, doing Monterey Car Week, being able to, like you said, you know, Redwood or Red over over overseas, probably 24 hour Le Mans at some point. You know, mm-hmm. the see. perception is that's everything, and you are living the dream job, just like you said. You know what? What's the reality behind a lot of that? Yeah, I used to get, and that's the thing. I, one of the things I hate when people say, "When do you work?" Because they see me, they they perceive that I, like I'm on a permanent vacation or something. What they don't see is a lot of those things you describe. I, I I'll leave like Friday afternoon. I'll take a half day. I get you know 25 days of vacation being an exec at a company so long, and I will literally take divide about three quarters of those days into long weekends. I'll just take a Friday here, Friday there, Friday there. And I'll either leave town Thursday night or Friday morning, and I'll rush and do that, and I'm back to you know back home by by Sunday night. So I pack in a lot and, uh, I'm a, and you're going to laugh, but every time I get up every day, I try to live two days in one day. I get up at five mm. o'clock in the morning. I, I wake up really early five o'clock and I, I work out and I, I uh, knock out some emails and, and I try to, you know, do as much as I can in the evenings. I'm tinkering on my cars or I'm catching up on a uh, dinner meeting uh, with business or friends. So I'm, I'm packing a lot. Eventually I collapse once in a while. I, after a month of doing that, I have a day where I just can't move for 20 hours. Um, but I've always been like, I'm a kind of hyper impatient person. So I tend to fill my calendar up. Um, and I love that stuff. And if I don't do it, I kind of miss it. So I, I try to, um, pack in a lot. That's all I can say. And I have friends that keep inviting me to cool stuff. And I'm like, oh man, I don't know how I'm going to make that work. And I find a way I've even done like lemons racing where I showed up literally right. an hour before I had to put my helmet on, jump in the car. I did a stint and then went home. <laughs> Just to- uh, check the file because a lot of times I'll promise my friends I'll do it and I forget I promise and it, and it comes up I'm like damn I promised I was gonna go to Gingerman and do a stint for them so stuff like that um, pretty crazy but I have a supportive family that that's always kind of let me you know pack that stuff in yeah I was gonna ask what's the trade off right it's got to be some of the family time yeah well well that we do um we do some pretty epic i mean over the years uh my family and i've done some epic vacations so i i make it up with you know we go we love traveling so i'm in australia with the kids tokyo um ireland uh, all over uh hawaii of course we love hawaii uh things like that so try to kind of so it's spendy but you know they love it my my daughters love you know spain and they love kind of these i would say 10 day long family vacations so also, the rest of my vacation days are all family you know and uh, sometimes you know, so like, a long walk in the park is pretty cool too, you know. <laughs> what do you? It's it's got to be cars twenty four seven, but if it's twenty three six, you know what else are you doing? Are you are you <laughs> like a secret closet nerd? You like watching Game yeah. of Thrones? You like watching this? Like uh, what do you do? Well, uh, if I I can't count Sims because Sims is actually cars too. But I like cooking. I, I started cooking a lot more. Uh, I, I I make a mean. Uh, mean pasta dishes and salads and uh, halibut. I taught myself how to make halibut fish. I eat mostly fish now. I don't really eat red meat much anymore. Stuff like that. I like cooking. I like uh, 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 building. I used to frame. I used to do a lot of basements for friends. I okay. love I love uh, working with wood and tools and stuff like that. And uh, drawing. You know, I, I want to get back to you know, that as I get a bit older. I want to start uh, sketching non-car stuff, you know, uh, scenes and people, animals. I love that stuff. So a lot of a lot of things I want to still do in the future. So Ralph makes a mean salad. You take you're taking credit for making a mean salad. A mean French um, a bib lettuce salad. It's amazing. <laughs> oh, that sounds that sounds super well, amazing. I'll go to a restaurant for you and try to re- reverse engineer it when I get home. So yeah, that's funny. Uh, two more for you. A lot of guys start on the outside of the car. You know, I, I may draw a wheel, a circle. Next thing you know, I'm drawing the side of the car, maybe a seat, maybe the engine, basically like the old road and track magazines. You started on the interior. Why? I uh, love it. It's because the interior is a collection of products. It's multiple, multiple products kind of um, in, in one space. So I really enjoy that. And when I draw cars I, on the exterior, I tend to, to look at the form first, just the basic lines, what three or four lines uh, communicate the shape of the car. To this day, I love designs like that. I love elegant designs that are, you know, you close your eyes and you can imagine them without 
they don't have to be fussy bullet details. They really just speak with their proportions. This is a personal one. So we were talking at Fountain Hills. This is mm-hmm. the second time, a couple weeks after we met. And you saw my podcast logo on the side of the car. Yeah. Now you've been on all sorts of things. Like I said earlier, everything. You've been doing this for decades. You saw the logo and you said, oh, you have a podcast. You know, we should connect. I'd love to get on the podcast and maybe we can help each other out. And I'm just some guy with a podcast. Why? I, I don't know. You struck me. I liked your car, <laughs> number one. Uh, and I thought you were uh, very approachable. And I think, uh, and I actually am enjoying the podcast as I hoped I would. So it's, uh, I think, peaceful souls. I'm, I tend to to be, um, tend to connect with people like that, that are they're not out to uh, sting anyone. They're out to learn and enjoy enjoy other humans. Um, and I have a simple motto in life is I leave people and things but as better than I found them. That's, that's my objective in life is, is to, uh, and I felt that you had the same kind of mentality. Well, thank you for the improvement on that. I could always, my wife will agree that, you know, if anyone can leave me better than they found me, it's probably, you know, great for her. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Rafa, thank you for, thank you so much for joining Hard Parking. Uh, we'll have to reconnect again soon. Let me know when you're in Arizona, get some coffee or something. I have a few other fun questions I would love to kind of pick your brain about. All right. We'll see you uh, when it gets a little cooler. <laughs> All right. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Rafa. Thanks. The Hard Parking Podcast, a little bit of cars, and so much more available anywhere you get your podcast or check it out at hardparkingpod.com.